Welcome to today's episode of The Growth Zone. I am Christian Bartsch. What is the core benefit of listening to this show? Business leaders in corporate and privately held companies gain insights into trends and strategies that provide them with a competitive advantage in the marketplace. Each episode focuses on an area such as marketing, sales, innovation or funding that is absolutely critical to the growth of companies, whether they are startups or corporate global players, where management needs to juggle the challenges of market entry or knowing how to navigate the uncertainties of disruptive developments. Mind feeding is where clarity evolves and helps solving organizational challenges. For those who listen to the entire episode, I have a special surprise gift. I am working on some great guests that are industry leaders in management, innovation and marketing. Let's get started on today's episode. So I'm today with Caleb Woods from North Carolina and today's topic is how the agile approach to software development can help businesses grow beyond their true expectations. But before we get started, Caleb, can you tell us please a bit more about yourself? Absolutely, Christian. You know, thanks for having me on the the, the show here today. Uh, really, you know, for me, I'm you know a bit of a technologist, but really my focus has been on solving business problems in my career. Um, and so as the CEO of Role Model Software, get a chance to do that a lot in, uh, in my day job. Uh, our focus is uh, we're a custom software consultancy, but we focus on crafting tailored solutions for our clients that allow them to you know, scale, amplify expertise, scale processes, um, some of that growth that you might take from particular users in your uh, organization that have an expertise and pushing that skill to um, lower uh, lower skill workers or um, increasing the scale that you can achieve with those people that are a part of that organization. So a lot of it for, for me focuses on business problems. What are the things that we want to focus on and grow and, and how do we uh, develop software solutions through collaboration uh, that really hit on those things. Oh, yeah, that's cool because it's so important nowadays. Um, businesses who have the right software, having it fit as well to the needs. Not every kind of software you can buy off the shelf. Um, it doesn't matter whether it's a small software or it's a big software. It's just, if it's important enough for the business, um, I'm sure it's definitely worth the investment and the time and, of course, the energy that you have to put into it. So um, before we get started, um, let's have a look again. So our topic is um, how the agile approach to software development can help businesses grow. Um, Caleb, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so so much about the agile approach to software development, and, and we've been a part of agile, you know, as a company in business for 20 plus years, um, working as an agile uh, company and approach before that was uh, one of the cool things and one of the buzzwords uh, in the software uh, scape. But what really for us that means is it's feedback loops. So much of software is not developed in a vacuum. It's developed in a context of your business domain or uh, the domain of which the problem is that we're solving. And we want to focus with an end goal. What are we trying to solve for you or your business or your users? And that brings value. But the aspect of the software journey is it's not, it's not a straight line. It's not identify all the things that you need to do. Here's the, the definite spec. And then it's just a matter of implementing things from there. Really, it comes down to having a feedback loop in that process and really multiple feedback loops at multiple levels so that we can pivot. We want to keep those end goals in mind so that we're not deviating from those, but there, we're going to learn new things along the way about the software that we're building. As you get working software in front of your users, you recognize that, oh, some of these things that you thought were important end up not being as important. And some of the things that you thought you didn't need become 
more important or new opportunities kind of discover that out of that. So it, a big part of that is that feedback loop um, and being in constant collaboration as we work through the process. Yes, that's true, because otherwise you uh, just don't get the user adoption. And that's what usually will as well influence whether your customers will decide to reinvest in, let's say, not just maybe adding more software, but maybe adding features, renewing, continuing to um, f keep the software fresh, updating it and that. And if users are not using it, there's no adaption. And that's the thing. Often, what I've seen in the past, um, you can buy a lot of software for thousands and thousands of dollars. But um, if people are not using it, then that's actually going to cost you more time and energy and much more money in the end. Because, of course, maybe you invest in training the staff to use the tools and then they don't want to use it. Mm -hmm. And later on, you actually maybe when you have a conversation, you find out, well, you've got that tool. Why aren't you using that tool? Well, we don't like it or it's too complicated or nobody told us how to use it or this and that. And that's, I think, some of these things that really uh, hinders and good soft adoption. But as you say, the feedback loop is so important during the development and at the beginning and towards the end as well so that people actually give you good feedback and you stay on track with what they really want and how they need it as well. Otherwise, it doesn't fit to their uh, reality. Think of it, yeah, it makes a big difference if, if, for instance, let's say for sales, if he can get the information and everything to his class customers properly, or if he has to click 20 buttons and uh, he still can't get anything out and gets frustrated. Mm -hmm. And the customer then thinks, ah, forget it, I go to somebody else. And uh, he sees his uh, promotion, his commissions, and all these things fading away and gets annoyed and said, ah, I just, I just don't care. I'm not going to use this stupid stool. I'll just open Outlook and send them a message. Boom. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. So that that's a big part of it too. Is the user isn't always equipped to know what they want exactly, or how to express that um, in terms of software. They know maybe what they're trying to accomplish, uh, the goals that they have, what success looks like, but to actually get to what the software solution is, it really requires a reflecting back of what are the business goals? What drives value? What's the context of which you're using the software? Like the, the sales example that you gave, am I uh, working in a cubicle where I'm doing a lot of calls and emails and a lot of uh, digital messaging in that way? Or am I out on the road and I'm interacting with customers face-to-face -face or, um, in showrooms, you know, what's the context of which that software is used? And that changes a lot about how we want to focus on building those solutions. If you're using a tablet, you know, at arm's length while you're talking with a customer on the floor, that's a different experience than here's this interface for uh, a digital selling tool where uh, I'm doing a lot of these things online or I'm maybe doing more data dense comparisons or, or whatever that process might look like. Yeah, because uh, otherwise it's, it just doesn't match. It's like you s develop a software for, for equipment that they actually don't have, or maybe mm -hmm. five people have, and, and the other 200 people who are supposed to work with it, they haven't got, so it doesn't work. Like, for instance, if you're developing an online app for sales and only three guys have a smartphone and everybody else doesn't have one that fits, let's say you're developing it for Android and everybody else has Apple, uh, that's not going to get much adoption, but first you have to get them the phones and then you have to get them to re-educate themselves to start using a different platform, which is maybe so different to them that they dislike it. And then you have this friction. Mm -hmm. So how, how, you would, how would you then overcome as well that friction, especially in software development? So a lot of what we do there is user testing early on in the process. So our goal is to build a walking skeleton. We, we call this a tiny implementation of the business goal that we're trying to solve for the customer. So if they're focused on a particular process or a particular um, piece of their business that this software is going to focus on, we want to zero in on that at the beginning of the project. We want to build the sort of happy path of that end to end. And that becomes the foundation for the system that we build on. We, we sort of stub out or ignore for the time being 
some of the common things that are going to come into play in the software that we're building. So things like managing users and thinking about roles and permissions, those are all important parts of software, but they aren't core to the business case that we're trying to solve for. So we want to focus on that early, get that feedback loop started. So then we can take that to the users who are going to be using the system and saying, how, how quickly can we get to a point where this tool can replace what you're doing on a day-to-day basis? When does this minimal viable product become actually viable such that you can start using it? So we try to do that with a couple of ways. You know, one is user testing, which is a lot of just putting the software in front of the users and asking them to walk through their thought process. That's where we discover some of those things that are not intuitive to them that they um, we would have thought were intuitive and where we can kind of take some of the rough edges off of, I wouldn't have thought you would have approached the problem that way, but now that I understand you do, or this is your context, we can really fold that into the early stages of the software. And so because we're having those actual users of the system involved early on, you know, we, we look at you know, some of the, the further range adoption questions of you know, what platforms, what, what's the, the users that are gonna be using this, how many of them, what's their sort of demographics to some extent. But a lot of it comes down to that actual testing, getting it in front of the users and watching them experience it. There's so many insights that come from our development team just watching users walk through the software. Yeah, and that's so interesting because, of course, users often um, will do things differently than maybe we as the programmers are then thinking or presuming that they're doing because we are so into the tools. We know all all the corners, all the back doors, all the sideways, all the codes and all the different commands and everything. And there you click and, there you click and everybody else is new to the house and thinking, uh, where's the gents? <laughs> Yes. How do I get out? Where's the exit in case there's a fire? And another person may be thinking, where do I get something to eat? I'm so hungry. <laughs> and it's different. Everybody is different somehow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's where we try to find those common patterns, you know, that we can we can adopt and bring into the software. But there are also going to be unique things about each business context that we've got to bring to bear and learn. So a lot of that for our team is learning the domain of the customer. What's the industry that you're operating in? What are the important things about that? And we want to digest that and understand it so that we can reflect it back to you. Um, that's how we really kind of can show our understanding. And when we have a deep knowledge of the domain, we move not from just uh, developers implementing a solution, but we become business consultants as well. Because now that we understand your domain in a deeper level, we can help to make some of those opportunity trade-offs and say, ah, here's what I'm understanding about how your business works and here's where you're trying to go. Here's an opportunity we can go in software because we have this platform and foundation and this is an easier thing to do than you might think versus going this other way that, that you might have been considering. Yeah, and, and even in such discussions, I can imagine very much that maybe the, uh, you might have, for instance, a few department heads who think the process is that's been done in the organization is step a b to c and mm -hmm. then suddenly somebody from sales or from marketing or logistics says no we do first a then we do c and then b and that says why that yeah because we have to first enter the data there and then we have to print it out and stick it on before and before we haven't done that we can't do uh, b mm -hmm. and thinks well then we should organize it differently why didn't anybody tell me and so on and then suddenly you notice oh, maybe we can actually improve something, not just through the software you're developing, but actually uh, they're improving as well the work process because at last the things are in the right order and it makes more sense. And it's yeah. less aggravation for users. And they say, wow, at last we've got somebody who's listening to us and, and helped us actually overcome this nightmare of every day trying to do these things the wrong way around. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. A lot of it is mapping that existing process. Like what, what do you do today? Um, but then what, what is the end goal? What's that point on the horizon that we're trying to get to? And what does an ideal process look like? Uh, because now that we're bringing technology into the scenario, there can be ways that we can shortcut and optimize that process, but we don't want to just uh, optimize the process that exists. That's a great way to, if you've got a process that, um, lets a little bit of water into the boat 
automating that just allows you to sink the boat faster. It doesn't actually help you to float or bail the boat out or, you know, think about things in that way. So we want to look at that process and look for the opportunities of, yes, you do it this way today, but in an ideal world, what is three years down the road with the growth goals that you have as a business? What does this look like um, as different uh, factors in the market change? Um, and, and how can we design help you to design that process? Exactly. And for instance, if it's marketing or so, and, and you've got uh, somebody from marketing, and they need to have somehow information going out, and they need to use it with the software and everything. And of course, you have to uh, start looking towards integrations with certain platforms that maybe are not so important now because they're not that big, but you're already seeing the trends that people are going to be using it. Mm -hmm. And that's where the companies have to be. And if they are still um, betting on something that's obviously going down and out and will no longer be important and relevant for the marketing message being placed on that, it makes no sense to invest all that energy into a system that maybe six months later, and we will be saying, well, it's been left. It's like, uh, for instance, uh, I would say 12, 15 years ago when MySpace was big and then suddenly from one day to another, uh, Facebook suddenly mm -hmm. appeared in many people's lives and they thought, okay, what's this? All the friends were moving suddenly and we're seeing now, of course, all these changes as well with with people going away from WhatsApp suddenly to, um, to Signal, for instance, or people going away from Facebook to Clubhouse and other places and other portals and back and forth and people are looking for new places. It means, of course, a chaos because many platforms, maybe they have ports, connections mm -hmm. to systems that actually allow them to advertise on a platform that in future will no longer hold their target audience. There's no point to integrate that anymore. Right. So you have to start looking, how do we do that? Yeah. Hmm. And in a lot of ways, that's why we look at the software systems we build as being a sustainable asset. So we want to focus on what we build from how do we reinforce the thinking and the, the modeling of that system such that you're not focused on building something directly tied to Facebook or you know MySpace in the past, but what's the, what's the business function that you're trying to accomplish there? There's some level of depth that you have to have there, but we want to create almost a seam, if you will. Um, if you think about it from stitching together pieces of fabric at a seam has an advantage of if you need to replace the other side, you have something that can be removed and slot something new in that. And so when we focus on building a system with those themes for future integrations, one, we're looking at it from, all right, how is this going to be sustainable long term? What happens if this solution does get Uh, changed out. And sometimes from internal software systems, that change is going to be much more minimal. So we're going to focus less on that seam. But when you're talking about some of these consumer tech sort of platforms, that seam is pretty important. How can we use standard protocols, standard ways of integrating, and then build around that a real solid uh, suite of automated tests? So that's a big part of our feedback loops for our development team is to have automated tests of the business cases, which is basically execution of the software by other software, so that as we're making these changes, we're not breaking some of those connections or we're, we're understanding what the core business case was. It's kind of built in documentation that actually runs and executes. And that's part of just our thinking around how do we create a sustainable asset? Uh, because we want to build and grow with our customers as their software development arm for Exactly, and that's uh, that's the advantage of having you as developers because, of course, they don't have to build up the expertise and knowledge and keep up to date with all different systems. Let's say mm -hmm. your customer starts migrating and they say, okay, we used to have a client server base. We'd like to have it now in cloud because, for instance, like times now is a pandemic where everybody is working from home using VPNs and other things can become a nightmare. And then they say, well, if we had it in the cloud, it would be easier It's less bandwidth we need. And that means, of course, they want to have everything that they had before in a client-server environment, suddenly have it in the, in the cloud. Um, their team might not be able to quickly adjust 
but your team is maybe already working on other projects and have gained the knowledge, experience, and knows what to do, what not to do, uh, what uh, gaps or mad paths to to avoid. And um, yeah, you can you can easily then start adapting a tool, not only because you know how to do it, but you know the tool as well, right? Because you yeah. developed it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in a lot of ways, you know, we're pulling that continuous learning. We want to not necessarily be living on the bleeding edge, but sort of on on the leading edge of what the technology looks like. We're we're focused mostly on solving problems for businesses and a lot of B2B related software. So we want reliable, sustainable solutions that we can build on. But that also means that we are going to be working and continuing improving the ways that we solve those problems. And so, yeah, that is that is a lot of it, kind of looking into the market of what's happening with the technology landscape of things on um, the early phases of the technology adoption curve, which of those things are going to cross the chasm and, and become part of the core tool chain and which, which things would, should we filter out? And so that's why experiments are a big part of our culture internally of how are we thinking about the things that are coming? Can we always be trying those continuous improvement type things within projects so that we can feed that learning back into the team and back into the solutions that we're building for our clients? Yeah, so um, yeah, that's really a good uh, point. And as you say, of course, agile approach, that's more or less um, what you've been uh, explaining here. and. Um, Yeah, and that's, I think it's definitely important to have the, all these things uh, going on when you're doing such software projects because otherwise the businesses you've got as clients, they can't grow and they can't grow as well with their needs as well um, as the software is eventually becomes a strategic part of their business. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, mm -hmm. And our vision really is to, you know, build solutions. You know, our our ten year target for for the 2020s is to build, uh, you know, 100 projects that make a significant impact in our customers' businesses um, by, you know, some of these things that we've talked about of the the agile process, the the feedback loops, uh, amplifying the expertise of the users that they have, and just making a significant improvement in those processes that we can bring our expertise from other domains and also just to come alongside along the journey of where they're at in growing their business. Yeah. Um, so it was great having you here on the show, Caleb. How can people actually connect with you? Yeah. Uh, so Role Model Software, you can find online at rolemodelsoftware.com. Uh, that's a great place to connect. Uh, there's a Uh, consultation button there that you can uh, jump on a call um, with me or one of our other uh, members of the team just mentioned that uh, you wanted to talk with me and really would love to just talk to you about kind of custom software options if that's a fit for you if that's something that you should consider for your business or or not and we like to kind of start from a consulting first approach and then uh, build from there if there's a good fit uh, for both of us. Great. I hope you enjoyed today's episode of The Growth Zone with Christian Barge. Thank you for listening. Please leave a review or rating here on iTunes or on podchaser.com. If you found the content helpful, then share it on social media. I would like to invite you to follow our show so that you don't miss the upcoming interviews with leaders in the market. Simply visit the website follow.prmediareach.com I will be adding the link also to the description of this episode so that you just need to click on that link. For those of you who are listening and signing up to follow the show, I have reserved a free copy of the ultimate guide on content marketing. This is the strategy that got me top corporate clients like McDonald's, Linde, Hewlett Packard, Deutsche Bank, Volvo and many others. That strategy has been working for over 10 years.
It also got me contacts with police, transport authorities, military and several universities and even leading research institutes. For sure, it also worked wonders as it got me many small, medium-sized entrepreneurs and enterprises as clients. And that even included international clients from all around the world. The link to sign up for our free broadcasting service and the guide is follow.prmediareach.com That will give you access to the most recent version of my ultimate guide on content marketing. You can follow me as well on Twitter by using the Twitter handle CAP Barge. That's spelled Charlie Alpha Papa Bravo Alpha Romeo Tango Sierra Charlie Hotel. Yes, that is CAP Barge. Charlie Alpha Papa Bravo Alpha Romeo Tango Sierra Charlie Hotel.